Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for uh, coming back to our session. I think this is going to be, uh, well, could be a depressing session. <laughs> but we're, we're not going to let it stay that way because we're going to give you a lot of good things to do. The, to the topic of our panel is post tolerance cultural tyranny. And it's really the growing movement to silence and intimidate people for their beliefs. It's happening in politics. It's happening on Main Street. It's happening on Wall Street. It's happening in our courts. It's increasingly pervasive. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But it's not intended to depress you. It's intended to give you all the education and information you need to know what's happening. But then we also want to tell you what you can actually do about it. Because we do still have time in this country to do something about it and to truly Push back, and that's really the goal of our session this morning. So here to talk about all this are four folks who uh, not just monitor this issue, but are really involved in the fight day to day. First, my colleague at the Heritage Foundation, Ryan Anderson, our senior research fellow in American in principles American and public policy. Public <laughs> policy, thank you. <laughs> Kelly Vidorik is joining us from Alliance Defending Freedom. She's legal counsel there. Mike Needham, as of yesterday, was the CEO of Heritage Action for America, and as of Monday, will be the chief of staff for Senator Marco Rubio of the great state of Florida. Every good panel needs an unemployed person in between jobs. <laughs> <laughs> just for the weekend, just for the weekend. <laughs> And then last but not least, my other colleague at the Heritage Foundation, Emily Cow. Emily is our director of the Helen and Richard DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. So Ryan, I'm going to begin with you. One of the areas where we've really seen this push take place is in the whole debate over trans the transgender mm. movement. Speak to that and what you see happening there. Sure. So one of the things that we saw after the Obergefell decision, uh, the Supreme Court decision that redefined marriage, was that um, various activist groups that had been pushing for the redefinition of marriage, they pivoted from the LGB part of the acronym to the T part of the acronym. And so almost overnight, um, most Americans who had never heard about transgender issues were now finding that they were now um, bigots and that transgender issues were now a matter of civil rights. Uh, and so one, less than one year after that Obergefell decision, the Obama Department of Justice and Department of Education redefined a 1972 law, which says you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. They redefined the word sex to say gender identity. And then they sent a letter to all of our nation's public schools saying that they had to redo their bathrooms, locker rooms, sports teams, dorm rooms, hotel rooms for overnight field trips, all on the basis of a student's gender identity rather than a student's biology. Um, when several states didn't want to go along with this, uh, the state of North Carolina, they passed a law saying, no, we're going to do bathrooms and locker rooms and sports teams based on biology, because biology isn't bigotry. Um, Loretta Lynch and the Justice Department sued the state of North Carolina. And you'll remember there was a huge um, uh, litigation that was going on there. And then there were all those boycotts. Bruce Springsteen canceled one of his concerts in North Carolina. Uh, the NBA threatened to move one of their championship games. And, and the hypocrisy there is quite astounding because there's the NBA and there's the WNBA. They're two different sports leagues for male athletes and female athletes. And they were now boycotting a state that wanted to have two separate bathrooms and locker rooms and sports teams for males and females. And then during that uh, press conference, the attorney general said that it's not that long ago that we had separate facilities for the races. And just as that was bigoted, so too is what North Carolina is doing today. So they used the argument uh, from the civil rights movement and from all of our visceral um, uh, repugnance at racism to suggest that people who believe we're male and female and that you know, privacy concerns suggest that men and women should have separate facilities are now the functional equivalent of racist bigots. Um, this gets worse because, um, unfortunately, what's happening is that they're now saying that the elites know better than everyone else. So during that North Carolina uh, litigation, they got a professor at Duke Medical School to tell the court there that everything that we thought was an objective fact of biology is, in fact, merely bigotry. So I, we have some slides. Um, well, this is, this is a first slide here. It's a book that I recently published on this issue um, when Harry became Sally responding to the transgender moment. And then within the book, the, the next couple of slides I'm going to show you are there. This is what the professor from Duke University's med school said. From a medical perspective, the appropriate determinant of sex is gender identity. It's counter to medical science to use chromosomes, hormones, internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, or secondary sex characteristics to override gender identity for purposes of classifying someone as male or female. 
Now, your laughter suggests just how ridiculous this is. When you all were students, the bread and butter of science was chromosomes and hormones and internal reproductive organs, external genitalia, secondary sex characteristics. And now Dr. Adkins is telling a federal court that it's counter to medical science to point to any of those objective facts of reality if they counter someone's subjective sense of identity. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, as the slide does, is that um, Dr. Adkins was the founding director of the Duke Center for Child and Adolescent Gender Care, which opened three years ago. Um, and, and that's where I want to go for the, the, the my, my final remark, is that now we see parents uh, who have children who are struggling with their gender identity, they're being told by people like Dr. Adkins that the appropriate response is to put your child on puberty-blocking drugs, to give your teenage um, daughter testosterone, to give your teenage son estrogen. And we've now had the first case in the United States where parents have lost custody of their child because they didn't go along with this. Uh, it came out of Cincinnati about three months ago. Uh, parents of a 17-year-old girl, uh, they wanted their girl to uh, work with a therapist so she could feel comfortable being a girl. Um, they, they wanted their, their daughter to receive uh, mental health care rather than transition care. The local hospital said, no, what your 17-year-old daughter needs is testosterone. And then a court sided with the hospital, and they removed custody from the parents. Um, and so unfortunately, that's where uh, things are now going. And the reason they're going there is because of a new ideology. Um, so what your children and grandchildren are now being taught at school uh, is the gender-bred person. Um, this is a graphic that's being used in um, schools across the United States. And it teaches that when it comes to our uh, bodily existence, that we have five different characteristics. You'll see there's gender identity, there's gender expression, there's biological sex, there's sexual attraction and romantic attraction. And the point of the graphic is to say that all of those things exist along spectrums. So that's why you see those various arrows. And you see at the very top for gender identity, it says womanness, manness, true spirit, or gender queer. <laughs> those are four of, quote, infinite possibilities. And your children and your grandchildren have to decide for themselves where their gender identity falls along that spectrum, where their gender expression falls along that spectrum. The gender-bred person got in trouble, uh, even though this was meant to be politically correct, uh, the gender-bred person got in trouble because he looks too much like a man. Uh, it's a gingerbread person. And so they made a new graphic, the gender <laughs> unicorn. <laughs> And you'll see that gender unicorn, a unicorn is a mythical creature. Unicorns don't actually exist. So it's actually, it's oddly appropriate that they chose a unicorn. But you'll now see in the very middle of the graphic, sex assigned at birth. It's no longer biological sex. The gender-bred person said biological sex. Now it's merely assigned at birth. Um, and it looks like Barney. It's meant to be appealing, visually appealing to your children and grandchildren to help them think that their own body, their sex, was merely assigned at birth, and therefore it can be reassigned later in life by a doctor. It can be reassigned through hormones and surgery. And that's the really subversive part of this. Like, we all laugh at it. It's so ridiculous. But it's shaping the way that young children think, including how they think about themselves. And if they experience a stage where they go through, where they have a conflict, where they don't readily identify with their bodies, Historically, what we did was we helped children align their thoughts and their feelings with their bodies. Now um, we're saying that we should change your body to align your body with your thoughts and feelings. And one of the reasons why is we're saying your sex is merely assigned at birth. And, and that's kind of the subversive nature of this because it's changing how people interpret their own thoughts and feelings and experiences. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Ryan. So you know this is a, an area and you've touched on it very well here, but we've done a lot of the Daily Signal on this issue, and we've had even people who have gone through these hormonal treatments and like coming back and saying why they so wish they had not done that and trying to inform people of why this is not the way to go and to please not do this to your children. So I would encourage you, there's nothing like a testimonial from someone who's been there to help people see what actually happened. So I'd encourage you to check that out on the, on the Daily Signal. Kelly, um, Alliance Defending Freedom, you all have taken up cases across the country, at the state level, the federal level. For people, in many cases, businesses, but people who are trying to live out their faith, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Masterpiece Cakes uh, story. I'll let you touch on that, but that's not the only one. That's right. Well, first, first I just want to thank 
Heritage for inviting me to be here. Alliance Defending Freedom counts Heritage as probably our closest ally in these battles and these fights. So it's such a privilege, one, to work with them on a daily basis. They do incredible work across the country at both the state and the national level. And it's just a privilege and honor um, to be able to have someone like the Heritage Foundation in these battles to partner with on a daily, 24-7 <laughs> pretty much, basis. As, as you're seeing, there's some pretty significant uh, issues that we're up against right now. So. On behalf of the entire ADF team, thank you to Heritage for the great, incredible work you guys do every day. Um, there are big issues going on, and I wanted to take a step back before we touch on the Masterpiece case uh, to talk a little bit about where, what laws are being used to even get us to this point. And we call these laws SOGI laws. They basically use a vehicle that was used in the 70s to combat racism, the non-discrimination laws. And what states and local municipalities are attempting to do is to add new classifications to these non-discrimination laws. So they're attempting to add sexual orientation and gender identity as protected classes. So essentially, with what Ryan was talking about, if you protect gender identity as a protected classification in a public accommodation law or in employment, the government now is empowered to come after that business, to come after that individual if they think that they're discriminating in some way on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. So these laws are really dangerous. They're dangerous to all Americans, regardless of who you are or what you believe, because they infringe on fundamental freedoms. And they essentially empower the government to come after individuals and dictate sort of what you're going to believe. And if you have an ideology that goes against current government ideology, it gives them the means to, to, to punish you, whether it's through fines. Some of these laws even have jail time. You could go to jail if the government thinks that you're discriminating on these bases. So there's three, I would say, primary uh, risks of these laws where they're really targeting Americans the most. One is freedom, particularly First Amendment freedoms. We're seeing them impact people's free speech rights, their religious liberty rights, the freedom to associate and bring together. Uh, but that's something that's so natural and normal to what America is. We were, we were founded to be able to, to follow our mission, to follow our conscience, to come together and, and work together and have that rich melting pot of ideas, to have that diversity. And yet these SOGI laws, they threaten that diversity. The second area which these laws present a very real danger is the area of, of privacy. Um, sort of what, what uh, Ryan was talking about, when you protect gender identity under the law, it then forces schools and, and businesses to now no longer be able to protect the privacy and dignity of those who are entering into their store, into their school. So basically, if a school wants to maintain separate restrooms and locker rooms for, for boys and girls, under these kinds of laws, now the state can come after them and say, you're discriminating based on gender identity if you don't allow the boy who thinks he's a girl into the girls' locker room. So very real risk to, to privacy and, and to dignity. And then third, they also impact um, economic liberty and economic freedom because they impose significant financial and legal liability on all Americans, particularly small business owners who are trying to do the right thing and follow their mission and protect their employees and serve the community, and yet the government's trying to come in and tell them how to run their business, how their mission should be enacted and, and complied with. So there's, those are the, the, real, the real threats. And they, I always try to say it's not so much about certain religious views versus the LGBT community. These laws threaten all of us. Even if you want to achieve a mission that's pro-LGBT, these laws will ultimately prevent and empower the government to come after them should the government want to. So who are the victims? There's a lot of victims. I know Emily's going to touch on how these laws impact really every single profession. No one should leave this room thinking, well, these laws may not affect me. Because if they're not doing so right now, they will at some point. Because we've seen them impact uh, churches, ministers, social organizations, adoption agencies, farmers. The list goes on and on. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that. But I, I want to spend the rest of my time just talking a little bit about the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, uh, which is up before the United States Supreme Court. For those of you that don't know Jack, he's a cake artist from Colorado. He's been in business for years. Jack serves every person that comes into his store. He serves everyone regardless of whether they're gay or lesbian. But like most creative professionals, 
Jack can't create all messages. He can't participate in all events. And one thing that's so important to, to note in any of these laws, the other side likes to say, well, they're discriminating based on sexual orientation. They don't like the person that walked into their, to their shop because they're gay. Jack serves everyone. It doesn't matter if they're gay or not. It's not about the person. It's about the event that the person is asking him to custom create a cake for. What message is he, are they being, is he being asked to communicate? What event is he being asked to celebrate? So a same-sex couple came in and asked Jack, to create a cake for their same-sex wedding. And Jack told, told the couple, I'll serve you anything else in the store, whatever you want, you can have, but I can't use my creative talent, my art, to create a message that goes against the core of who I am. So long story short, Colorado sued Jack. Um, his case made it way, all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Of note, the Colorado Commission told Jack no, not only does he have to create cakes, even though the message might violate his convictions, he had to re-educate his entire staff, which includes family members. He also, the commission also compared his beliefs to perpetrators of the Holocaust. They talked about religious liberty and conscience as being, um, I'm trying to figure out the right exact quote here, a despicable piece of, of rhetoric. So they very much showed a significant amount of animus toward Jack and his beliefs if he dared to disagree with the, what the government wants him to do. So his case is uh, before the Supreme Court. We had oral argument in that case back in December, and so we're awaiting to see what the Supreme Court will do. But at stake, it's not about just Jack and, and his free speech rights and his conscience. Every single one of our freedoms lies in the balance. So regardless of our beliefs about same-sex marriage, regardless of our beliefs really about anything, at stake is whether or not the government will continue to respect our First Amendment freedoms and allow us to peacefully live and work consistent with our convictions, or whether it'll be able to pick and choose which beliefs it's okay with and which ones aren't, and then punish those who dare to disagree. A lot of uh, maybe more bad news. I will say the good news um, with regards to these laws Together with Heritage and many of our allies, we've been successful in stopping states since 2011. There's only one state since 2011 that has adopted one of these laws at a statewide level. And I think that's because we're seeing increasingly and Americans and lawmakers are recognizing these laws actually do hurt freedom. There's so much litigation. This Jack's case is one of many that, that we're litigating in the courts. There's a lot of constitutional implications when you adopt these laws. And so I think that is good news, that we had seen a trend. There were 21 states, now 22 with Utah, that have adopted them. But in the past now seven years, almost seven years, no state has adopted one of those. So I think that's, that's encouraging as, as we continue to closely follow Jack's case. Right. Thank you, Kelly, very much. Uh, Mike, we've seen this recently play out on, on Capitol Hill. And before I ask Mike to speak, we're going to show you a clip. Uh, Senator Cory Booker from the wonderful state of New Jersey. Uh, who, I, we have some folks here from New Jersey, right? Yeah, he's your senator. Um, <laughs> here, <laughs> he, he, oh, he, he had some interesting questions for Mike Pompeo uh, during his confirmation hearing to be Secretary of State, things that you would think had nothing to do with whether it was somebody was competent to be Secretary of State, but had everything to do with what they thought about, what he thought the definition of marriage ought to be. Let's take a look at that and then we'll come to Mike. Is being gay a perversion? Senator, I, 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 when I was a politician, I had a very clear view on uh, whether it was appropriate for two same-sex persons to marry. I stand by that. So, you, so it's, you do not believe it's appropriate for two gay people to marry? Senator, I continue to hold that view. It's the same view. And so people in the State Department, I met some in Africa that are married under your leadership. You do not believe that that should be allowed? Senator, I, I, we have, I, I believe it's the case we have married uh, gay couples at the CIA, you should know. I treated them with the exact same set of rights. You believe, exact that, same you believe that gay sex is a perversion? Yes or no? Senator, if I, if I can... If you're yes or no, sir. Moment, if do you believe that gay sex is a perversion? Because it's, it's what you said here Senator in Mike, one of your speeches. Yes or no, do you believe gay sex is a perversion? Yeah, wow, right? Wow. Uh, and unfortunately... 
he's up for election. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that's not the only hearing where you've seen this kind and line of questioning, questioning somebody's religious beliefs, their personal beliefs uh, come into play. We even saw it with our own Russ vote uh, at Heritage Action. So, Mike, if you will, speak to what you're seeing just in the political arena and how this intimidation is taking place. Yeah, well, I, I think at the outset, we should be clear about what we're facing. The, the progressive left hates many of our traditional American values. Uh, they think that they have absolutely no role to play in the public sphere. Uh, they're willing to use any tool, and they especially love using tools outside the regular democratic process uh, to try to keep traditional American views out of the public sphere. They'll use the courts, uh, they'll use the administrative state, they'll use bullying from corporate America. Um, and increasingly, and, and under this president, we're seeing them apply unconstitutional religious tests uh, to nominees that President Trump has made. Uh, many of you know Russ Vogt, who was the vice president of Heritage Action, uh, for the first six years that we, exi that we existed. Russ was nominated to be deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, Russ went to Wheaton College, it's a Christian college, uh, that has a policy um, that at this Christian college, only evangelical Christians uh, who share the beliefs of, of the university uh, will teach there, which obviously in this day and age became controversial. Uh, Russ spoke out while he was at Heritage Action, wrote a piece as an alum, uh, defending that, defending his belief uh, that all professors at Wheaton uh, should acknowledge Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, and Bernie Sanders used this in his confirmation hearing to say that Russ was unqualified uh, to be deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, that believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior disqualifies you from being the number two at the Office of Management and Budget in the federal government. That is literally a religious test that was applied to Russ. Um, the deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget under George W. Bush was confirmed in 12 days under Barack Obama, it was confirmed in eight days. It took Russ 15 months to be confirmed, um, which speaks to many problems that we have in the United States Senate, but one of them was this unconstitutional religious test that Bernie Sanders tried to apply. Um, separately, we saw a Catholic uh, law professor from Notre Dame uh, who was nominated by President Trump to become a judge, um, where Dianne Feinstein uh, said in her hearing that you could tell the dogma speaks loudly within you. Um, and of course, we've seen uh, what happened with Mike Pompeo, who will be a fantastic Secretary of State, um, having been a fantastic CIA director, uh, and whose beliefs uh, about same-sex marriage expressed as a member of the House, where he was a fantastic House member, um, have no bearing on his ability to, to represent our nation as Secretary of State. Um, and so time and time again, uh, we have seen them with President Trump's nominees applying religious tests. Um, but it's completely consistent with what they're doing in every other sphere, that, where they will use any tool of bullying to try to keep our traditional American beliefs out of the public square. Mike, one area too, we, we've talked a lot in the past about cultural cronyism as well, but speak to the economic side of this too. Sure, absolutely. Do, does anybody remember what, uh, what Hillary Clinton said a couple months ago when she was in India? Um, it was kind of, it was remarkable from the standpoint of a former Secretary of State uh, talking about her um, fellow citizens in a foreign country this way. I, I shouldn't say remarkable, it was deplorable, um, actually. What she did. <laughs> so she explained why people voted for Donald Trump, and she said that the 63 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump uh, resent the fact that blacks have rights, uh, resent the fact that women are in the workforce, um, resent the fact that Indian Americans succeed. Um, remember, these are people who support a president who has the most phenomenal ambassador to the United Nations <laughs> Um, an Indian American former governor, Nikki Haley, uh, at least since Jean Kirkpatrick. Um, but what she was articulating was actually a belief that there are some public policy questions um, where if you disagree with the progressive left, it can be for no other reason than the worst forms of animus um, imaginable. In this case, it was voting for Donald Trump or probably in Hillary's mind, more just not voting for her. Um, but it's true, if you hold a belief that is, that is animated by this type of animus, it should be um, banned from the public sphere, but they are using um, uh, these forms of bullying to define things that are not motivated by animus um, as driven by animus and therefore being driven from the public sphere. Sphere. They know that they can't win these arguments through democratic means, and so they go uh, through other means. Now, as conservatives, we're very comfortable in, econo in the economic sphere about making these moral arguments. Um, we're very comfortable in saying that it is wrong because Solyndra never would have gotten um, funding from the private sector for the government to come in and use the nation's largest venture capital company, the Department of Energy, to fund Solyndra. Um, we're very comfortable saying it is wrong when Solyndra was a, a contributor to Barack Obama 
uh, for that decision to be taken out of the markets, out of the regular democratic process, and done through cronyism. We need to be better at making these arguments on cultural issues as well. Uh, it is wrong for the left to take a point of view which, in which uh, individuals in our country have the right to hold and are not motivated by animus, uh, that same-sex marriage uh, is not a marriage that should be recognized by the federal government, and win that argument through the courts rather than the democratic process. It is wrong to say, if you want to force Catholic nuns to buy birth control, uh, that you're not going to do that through the democratic process, you're going to do it through the administrative state. It is wrong to use corporate bullying to force states um, to require Catholic adoption agencies uh, to, to provide adoptions in a, in a form that, that, that's inconsistent with their beliefs. And so in the same way that we see the left using the swamp, using cronyism, uh, using corruption to advance their economic agenda, they're using it to try to ban our beliefs from the public sphere, and we need to be very firm and very strong in standing up against it uh, and demanding that they win the argument in the public sphere in a democratic debate uh, and not through these forms of cultural bullying that increasingly they're, they're using to win. Emily, you uh, follow this issue, not here, but just internationally. Let's give it up for Mike, that's good. And like there's Jeff a lot Bush, that- clap, please. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot that we can look at when you look at the rest of the world and we can see, okay, how it's played out there and what could be coming here. Talk about the kind of four stages that you see of, of this cronyism uh, and this tyranny, if you will, and, and how it's playing out here, where you think we are. Thanks, Genevieve. So I think it's important to realize that religious freedom is on a spectrum and every nation is either improving or it's declining. And the four stages of attack on religious freedom are uh, first cultural and then economic and then uh, legal, inc including criminal penalties, and then the fourth is violence. And so I'll just briefly provide a couple examples. So with the social hostilities, I think the, unfortunately the example that doesn't go away is anti-Semitism. Um, it's the demonization of people based on their beliefs or their identity in a group, and we see it on the rise again in Europe now, in Poland, and in the UK, and unfortunately it's coming from government officials as well as from civil society. And what that does is it creates an in-group and an out-group, which then makes it easier to go into the next level of attack on religious freedom, which is economic discrimination. And I think India India, unfortunately, provides an excellent example of that. 70% of Christians in India are part of the Dalit caste, which is the lowest caste in society. As a result, they have very limited educational and economic opportunities. They're relegated to doing the dirtiest jobs in society, cleaning um, toilets and being um, taking care of animals. And then in the, in the final final two stages, I'll provide an example that relates them. So in Pakistan, there's a Catholic woman who was put on trial for blasphemy. Um, she was accused by her coworkers of insulting um, the prophet Muhammad when she tried to just share a water jug with them. And so she's been on death row. A liberal Muslim politician came to her defense and he was assassinated by his uh, militant bodyguard. And then the minister of minorities in the country, who's also a Christian, came to his defense. He was also assassinated by a militant. So that, that's an example of how things can progress from one stage to the next if these trends are not stopped. Hmm. Where are we in the United States, do you think, today? So unfortunately, um, since 2010, the Pew Research Center has documented increasing both government restrictions on religious freedom and social hostilities towards religious freedom. So it's been on the decline since 2010, and then the Obergefell decision has radically accelerated that process. As you've just heard, the litigation has increased, um, the laws that are being uh, pushed at the state and federal level have increased. And I'll just go through briefly the first two stages in the United States. So you've had so many examples already <laughs> of the social ostracization of social conservatives. And one person I want to mention in particular, um, does anybody here know who Tim Gill is? Well, <laughs> he is um, a multimillionaire who has donated $422 million to LGBT rights groups. And he was quoted last summer in Rolling Stone magazine saying that the purpose of all his philanthropy is to punish the wicked. The wicked are those who support marriage between one man and one woman. And so I think it's very interesting that he's able to say that in a national publication like Rolling Stone magazine with no fear of consequences. And you combine that with 
the high-level government officials like Senator Booker, who are demonizing Mike Pompeo so publicly. And so Mike Pompeo's example actually leads into the next stage, which is the economic discrimination. And as Kelly said, don't think it's just about people like Jack Phillips. So I have a list here of the 18 professions that have been affected. And the first level is people who have some interaction with marriages or weddings or sex transition. So in this category, there are nine. County clerks, uh, people who host weddings, like bed and breakfast owners, bakers, florists, photographers, videographers, calligraphers, counselors, and uh, doctors I added to this list because of the lawsuits against um, a hospital that won't provide a uh, uterus removal for a, um, a healthy woman who thinks she's a man. The second category is people who have spoken in, in one context about their belief in traditional marriage. Mike Pompeo is a perfect example in diplomacy. And then we also have the military emergency services, um, entertainment technology, academia, and lawyers. And Mr. Um, Attorney General Meese has written extensively on ABA Model Rule 8.4, and that would basically be a speech code that could lead to disciplinary action against lawyers who speak um, in support of traditional beliefs on marriage. And then the third and final category is people who merely have an association with uh, a belief that doesn't fit into the new sexual orthodoxy. And that is um, student teachers who were um, banned from the local school district because they simply attended Gordon College. And then also um, another federal judge uh, who was questioned about his membership in an Anglican church that teaches that marriage is between one man and one woman. That was from um, Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. What about this family that we see? I know you have a slide. Speak to who, who they are, because it's a case that I think, again, many people would go, this shouldn't be impacting them. Thank you. So this battle is really playing out between Main Street and Wall Street. And the Tennis family, they are clients of Alliance Defending Freedom in Michigan. They're retired military. They decided after their retirement they would start farming. And so they purchased a farm. They started growing apples and all kinds of other fruit. They employ people of all different types of um, beliefs and political orientations and people who are LGBT. They also occasionally host weddings on their farm. And they were questioned by somebody on Facebook about whether they would host a same-sex wedding. And they said, because of our Catholic beliefs, we can't do that. Uh, then a farmer's market, there's a farmer's market where they sell their apples, 22 miles away from where they live, East Lansing, Michigan. East Lansing has one of the SOGI ordinances that Kelly talked about. East Lansing said, you can no longer sell your apples here simply because you had this posting on Facebook about same-sex marriage. And so now they've created this barrier to entry into this market for this family to simply sell apples. Um, and so you might be wondering, why is a little you know, city like East Lansing going out of its way to impose this draconian punishment on this family? That brings me to the next slide, please. Wall Street. So I'd like to pull back the screen for a minute and, and take you into what I call the unholy triad um, of how the, the corporations are being influenced um, through the donors and the activist organizations. So back to Tim Gill. He gives $422 million to groups like Human Rights Campaign. Human Rights Campaign has a corporate equality index that rates all of the major companies and major law firms in the country on how LGBT friendly they are. But that translates into demanding that they support SOGI laws, both at the state level and at the federal level. And so Google and Apple and Amazon, they've all signed on to supporting the Equality Act. Um, who here is familiar with the FANG companies? So, yeah, so I see some hands up. Facebook, um, yeah, Facebook, Am Amazon. Amazon, Netflix, and Google. They have uh, a capitalization of $2.2 trillion. They, the four companies represent 50% of the capitalization of the NASDAQ 100. They, they, all three of them support the Equality Index, uh, support the Equality Act, and then Netflix has actually 
gone to the state of Georgia and opposed religious freedom protections in that state. And so it's from Tim Gill, you get the money. From Human Rights Campaign, you get the radical ideology and policy proposals. And then you have ma major companies like Apple supporting these policies. And so when you see these Main Street versus Wall Street battles, I mean, I'm sure that the Tennis family probably has no idea of all the corporate money that is going into these policies. But that is what is happening. All right, we're going to get to, I promised we would talk about solutions and what you can actually do. But before we get into specifics on that, we want to give a chance for you all to ask questions of our panel here. So if you just raise your hand, we'll come up to you with a mic. First question. We have one right up here at the very <laughs> front. Best answer to the problem is take the Trump approach, counterattack. The enemy, the left, the progressives, are committing a far greater crime against our Western civilization and civil rights than any of this stuff you're talking about. They are running a gulag archipelago, prison camps without borders, without fences. They have imprisoned in our cities the blacks and the Hispanics by design for the purpose of having a captive and publicly supported, being it us, our taxes, are running their gulags. And they're keeping those people in there on purpose, by design, semi-literate at most, at best, graduating uh, with a high school diploma, people four out of ten cannot read above the fourth grade level. They can't count, they can't make change in a cash register. They have condemned these people to a meaningless life because they're not capable of functioning. They're unemployable in the modern world. They have sacrificed those lives to their purpose. This is a real crime. Stop talking about this details and start, start talking about tens of millions whose lives have been destroyed by these people who now want to undermine our civilization. Don't let this be your subject. <clears throat> Counterattack, charge them, use the word, the, word, the law against them because the law says every child shall have a real education. They're depriving these kids, and they're doing it on purpose. OK. Thank you. I, you began by saying, go ahead, take it. Um, the whole issue of, of maybe how Donald Trump has approached this, I, many would say that you know Donald Trump's election, much of that was about the fact people were so wanting to fight back on political correctness, wanting to fight back on the fact that these kind of things are being pushed and people were feeling silenced, and he was actually standing up and saying, no, this isn't right anymore, and we're not going to take it. Mike, would you, how much of, yeah, I mean, we I, saw in the polling, certainly. No, there's no doubt that, that President Trump's willingness to take on the left, his willingness to take on the fight, mm -hmm. his willingness um, uh, to provoke was, it, was a major part for his victory. I think more broadly, uh, on your point, Bob, um, Chesterton talks about um, the difference in freedom between children who are playing on an open field on the edge of a dangerous cliff um, if there is a fence or if there isn't a fence. And that for the true blessings of liberty to be achieved, when you're playing in that open field, you need to have a fence. Um, the fence in our Western civilization uh, that the freedom we fight for um, is the dignity of work, it's the family, it's faith, it's community. Those are the things that we need to have as a civilization um, to truly have functioning freedom. And I think to your point, uh, there is no doubt that the left um, is absolutely committed to attacking each of those four um, principles. And that's why this topic, as it relates to faith, as a result, it relates to families, I mean, it relates to work, as Emily was just talking about, uh, is so important. When you look at uh, the left and their idea of a, a universal basic income, of, uh, essentially hush money uh, for people who have lost their ability to work, um, uh, given what the left has done with regulations and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the left is engaged in an effort to tear down those four principles that hold up our civilization so that it will be replaced by government. And our task as conservatives 
uh, needs to be, to be steadfast in fighting for the dignity of work and for family and for faith and community. Um, and we need to do that with the ferociousness which with President Trump has done it, which the left is coming at us, um, because the attacks, as nobody knows better than Ryan, um, who's had death threats and has security provided to him by heritage, uh, will be ferocious uh, if we stand up for those four bedrocks of Western civilization. L let me add one quick thing. Um, about a year ago, Heritage created a center for education policy. And I think this gets directly to your question. We always had someone working on education policy. And then a year ago, we elevated that to an entire center. And you heard yesterday from Lindsey Burke, the director of the education center. You heard this morning from Jonathan um, Butcher. And what they're trying to do is precisely what you're talking about, help families get out um, of those traps. They're trying to do school choice reform, um, education reform more broadly, education savings accounts, things like this, so that families who want their kids to have a good education can escape the public school system. Uh, what they want to do is they want to provide the option, the freedom to those families that rich people have via their wealth. Right? So why should poor people be trapped in these failing schools? We can use vouchers, we can use education savings accounts, we can use school choice and competition to force these schools to get better and to allow families to escape the ones that are failing. And I think that gets exactly what you're talking about. So at Heritage, we try to do both and. Right? So we're going to have this panel and we're going to have the Education Center, because um, we have to engage on all sides of these issues. And Lloyd, do you want to comment? Well, I just wanted to give a few recommendations. Sure, Because I would like people to come away from today you know, with some some action items that you can do in your existing spheres of influence. You don't need to do anything new. Um, so in the social arena, just continue to speak up for your values. It's so important to show courage in this area, not only to persuade other people, but to encourage younger people, the next generations, to speak up for truth. Second, in the economic area, if you are a shareholder of an organization or if you're even on the board of an organization that's being pressured by the human rights campaign or other liberal groups to support these political agendas like the SOGI laws at the federal level or state level, just raise your voice and say, just focus on business. You don't have to take all these radical leftist political positions. Just focus on your business, give the money back to the shareholders, and we will invest our money in social causes as we want. Also, you can frequent those um, businesses on Main Street and on Wall Street that have the same values as you do. Uh, Bridget just told me today about Second Vote, which is an app that provides that kind of information about the values of different corporations. Um, and then in the civil arena, I've heard that many of the Sentinels are already engaged in local school boards, and that is so important because you are on the front lines. You are the early warning system to us of what's happening on the local level. That's what's going to happen on the state and the federal level. So I just have a copy of Ryan's book. If you know someone who's on a school board or if you want to give this to people who are on school boards, we are happy to send you copies. We think every school board member should have a copy of this book. And then if you're a lawyer, you can join the ethics committee of your state bar and make sure that that state doesn't adopt ABA Model Rule 8.4. And then finally, in politics, already I think you understand the importance of getting the right people in office and, the right, and getting the wrong people out of office. Uh, we encourage you to do this not only at the federal level, but also at the state level. Um, our colleagues at ADF are working really hard on the state policies. There are other organizations that are really working hard on getting the right people elected at the state level. Um, so these are some concrete suggestions which, you know, think about your own spheres of influence. It may not be something that just you do. It could be something that, you know, your son or your daughter or your friends could be involved with. Are there anything coming from Alliance Defending Freedom as our final couple of minutes here? Any tools that you all have that would be helpful for these folks to know about? Well, I think it's important to, as sort of Emily was touching on, just to, to remember that civil liberties, they travel together and we all stand and fall together. So when you see religious liberty chipped away, soon you'll see economic freedom and, and it, it, there's a slow erosion. Um, I think right now, you mentioned Tim Gill and the, the Fang companies, they're currently targeting Kansas and Oklahoma. Kansas, and I don't know if we have anyone here from Kansas or Oklahoma, but both those states are seeking to pass very modest protections for adoption agencies and foster care providers to make sure they're able to continue to keep kids first and keep that marketplace rich with a, with a broad array of providers for these kids. Um, and yet these companies are coming in and threatening to pull business, again, out of the state. Um, they're literally on the ground now. Chad Griffin, the head of the Human Rights Campaign, 
are on the ground in Kansas and Oklahoma trying to defeat these very, very modest protections that essentially just codify what's already in our First Amendment. So I say all that to, to say stay engaged. If you hear about something at the state level or at the local level, let us know. We want to be a resource there, whether it's with messaging or with talking points or with resources to be able to, to defend our freedoms so that our children and our grandchildren will be able to grow up and have, have the same freedoms that, that we've enjoyed in, in our lifetime. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. W one thing I, I wanted to uh, in encourage in this process is uh, the, is the tone with which we do it, because the mm -hmm. le the left has been quite strident on a, on a lot of the, this stuff. And if our people can respond in a way that they are both sticking to their principles, but also being pleasant and likable. It makes a huge difference. I know I, I deal a lot with, with law school campuses, and I see that in, in, in law school campuses, see how very successful our chapters are when they are in situations where there's a, a great deal of disagreement with their views, but they can get very far when their tone is good and nowhere near as effective if they respond, as we're all inclined to respond, to, Come on, this is absurd. What are you doing? You're crazy? You know, type of thing. It, it, but the, so I, I would encourage us all to encourage our people in this battle yep. in, terms of, in terms of tone. And I think, uh, um, you know, uh, th does, that make, does that seem to make sense to all of you? Absolutely. Ryan, you want to speak to you? You've done a lot of this on college campuses where the tone is not always super right. civil, but you've usually maintained yours when I've watched you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Gene's exactly right that um, frequently, um, uh, when you see these protests going on at college campuses, um, it's the most um, uh, um, outrageous response to people who are very mild-mannered, right? So it's Charles Murray as a speaker, um, and then they're like grabbing the hair of the professor who is his host and sending her to the hospital with whiplash. I mean, that's how ridiculous it is. Charles Murray is civil, he's friendly, he's soft-spoken. Imagine how much worse it would be if Charles Murray wasn't that way. Right? And so what Gene's pointing out is that um, they're already coming after us when we are being civil and respectful. It'll be much worse if we're not. And the campuses that have the most success where you don't see these protests um, are the ones where the speakers are civil, the student leaders are civil, but they don't pull their punches. Right? They're, they're, they're also engaged on the issues. Um, so I think Gene's right, but it also just says that the left's still going to be unreasonable. Even someone like Charles Murray at Middlebury got protested, and Charles isn't a bomb thrower. He's a very, uh, you know, he's at one of our competitor think tanks. He's at AEI, but he's a very smart uh, individual, and there should be no reason for him not to speak at a college campus. But I think, and I think, oh, go ahead. so Jen, I just think we should also acknowledge that there's nobody better than Ryan at making these arguments in a, a civil way and um, a courageous way. Which, you should, which in and of itself yourself, drives left crazy. You, right. because they, <laughs> he makes these arguments in a yeah. civil way in the book. You, you should, everyone should get a copy. He's happy to sign them for you. I <laughs> warn you, it does lower the resale value of the book. <laughs> if you're, it makes a great doorstop. You can swat flies with it. So everyone should get the book. I think Brian does a really good point, too, and your point's very well taken. Being winsome, being compassionate in these battles is so, so important. And remembering we're not just fighting for certain, certain individuals' freedoms. I mean, I think Brian did a great job of this, of talking about and I think about this often when we're working on the transgender issue in particular, these children who are, these children are very real. Their struggle with this is very real. But they're also being used as pawns by a political left who's trying to use them. And so we fight for them as well when we're engaged on this to have them be able to live lives and be, be loved, to feel loved, to know who they are. So it's so important, it's so easy when you see the gender bred man or the unicorn to, to have a reaction, and that's normal. But taking a step back when we're engaged on this and talking to others, talking to parents who have probably a friend or a child who is struggling with this, to, to be compassionate, to understand what they're dealing with, and then and lead, lead them then to the, to the truth in a winsome way. All right, one more question. Well, one more question. It's not so much a question as a thought. I, sort of the, the unicorn symbol, and I realize why I'd like to be in heritage and support such organizations, I don't want to be surrounded by unicorns. I like the people in this room. I, I don't know how I'd uh, handle being surrounded with unicorns. Okay, yes, ma'am. Uh, are we compiling statistics on those 
most um, people that are taking these transgender um, medical procedures or uh, medicines and uh, that they realize after they've gone through this that it, they should not have? So yeah. there are some studies on this. Just repeat your question. Yes. Oh, so, so the question for, for people who couldn't hear is, you know, are we um, conducting studies and keeping statistics on people who have transitioned and who then regret it? Um, and the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is that it's more complicated. Um, the only people who are really conducting studies on this are the activists who have a vested interest in the outcomes. Um, so there are lots of studies that show regret is rare, and they'll claim that it's less than 2% of people who regret it. Um, but then you look at the actual study, and it finds out that somewhere around 50% didn't respond to the survey. And so you, it's left wondering if, if everyone's so happy with this, why did half of the people not respond when the hospital followed up? Mm -hmm. right? And are they feeling shame? Because they, they get attacked. The third chapter of my book is the chapter on people who transitioned and then detransitioned. Mm -hmm. And many of them say, you know, I, I'm writing this anonymously because I don't want to get attacked by the left. They'll call me a self-loathing <laughs> trans individual. Um, many of them, you can find some of their uh, videos on YouTube mm -hmm. where they're like, I wanted to make this video previously, but I was ashamed of my face. Um, because uh, in this case, it was a high school girl who transitioned to live as a man, and then five years later detransitioned. But the testosterone, she now had uh, facial stubble. She had had a double mastectomy, so she had removed her breasts. Her voice had changed as a result of five years of testosterone, and she couldn't get any of that back. Mm -hmm. Your breasts don't grow back after a double mastectomy. Your vocal cords, once they lengthen and thicken, they don't go back to a female-pitched voice. And the facial follicles, the hair follicles, once they come in, unless you have electrolysis, they won't go out. And so she was speaking just of like the shame that she feels as a result of this. So a lot of the people who do regret this, they don't want to speak up, and they're not responding to those surveys. Um, the last thing I'll add on the statistics, there was a study uh, two months ago published in the journal Pediatrics that showed a six-fold increase in young people identifying as transgender. Historically, it's been around half of 1%. And it was now 3%. Um, and what that suggests is that if you tell kids that they could be trapped in the wrong body, and if you tell kids that their sex is merely assigned at birth, more kids will come to believe it. And I, would, I mentioned at the very top that we've been covering this issue a lot on the Daily Signal. And we had one of the articles written was by a pediatrician. Uh, and she really does include a, a, a lot of numbers and statistics on children and the fact that the vast majority who struggle with this during their puberty years, once they come out of puberty, it's a settled question for them. They, they're no longer confused uh, if they're allowed to actually go through puberty. Uh, and so, but that's just one example. She has a lot of good information. So I would definitely encourage you uh, to go to the Daily Signal and search that because especially if you know other parents, grandparents, who maybe they have a child who's struggling with this, it would be good information for them to know from a medical mm -hmm. professional as well. All right, do we have one final question? One final one right here, and then I'm going to invite my other colleague. I mean, yeah. When you go through puberty, you struggle. I mean, and there are always people who say, oh, I have a girl crush. And there are always people who say, as a boy, oh, I like to do things that are sort of girly. And these people can, if there's pressure, you can get pressured along in yep. the groups mm -hmm. of people, and a boy can get pressured along to act possibly in ways that he might not act. Mm -hmm. and then you Yeah, so, so the, the, the research in this shows that uh, it's 80 to 95% of young people would naturally grow out of a stage of gender dysphoria if development is allowed to continue. Um, one of the studies on puberty blocking drugs showed that 100% of the kids who were placed on puberty blockers persisted in their transgender identity. So imagine that swing from 80 to 95% naturally growing out to 100% remaining. Um, and what this suggests to many doctors is that this is a self-reinforcing treatment protocol. That if you give a five-year-old boy a new name and a new wardrobe, if you give the 10-year-old boy puberty-blocking drugs, if you give the 15-year-old boy estrogen, the final outcome is much more likely that that boy's gonna identify as a girl. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas if you let that boy know, look, it's okay, you're a boy who enjoys playing with dolls. That doesn't mean you're a girl. Right. And then you let that boy go through puberty where he gets the rush of testosterone. The final outcome may very well be a boy who feels comfortable being a boy. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's at stake here. It's human lives. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank our panel here. Emily, Mike, Kelly, Ryan, thank you. Thank you all.